All right, uh, let's get started. Well, I'm going to uh, do a, a quick prayer, and uh, uh, we'll ask the Lord's blessing on this meeting this morning and what we have to teach, and then we'll jump right into our study. Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for the magnitude of your love and your grace and how you've displayed your love to us through that grace as you gifted your son uh, to take all of our sins on himself at Calvary to suffer your wrath in our place for those sins and that the only thing you ask us to do now is to believe that those sins are gone and that Christ put them away and he did so at Calvary and then you clothe us in the, us in the skins of our righteousness by, by placing us into Christ himself. Thank you for that. We thank you for the message before us today. We thank you for all things, for it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right, we want to return once again to the book of 1 Corinthians. That's our, uh, our, our, our letter text, we might say, uh, for our studies. And our, our previous message, if you recall, it was entitled Sectarian Saints, Divisions, Separations. And uh, Paul began this epistle by reminding these saints at Corinth about their position in Christ. He always began positively building them up. He called them saints. Uh, they had been set apart as holy unto God, not based upon their behavior, but based solely upon their belief. Uh, the reason Paul wrote this letter is that word had gotten to Paul from the household of Chloe <laughs> that there were some problems taking pay, place in that Corinthian assembly. And Paul knew that these problems could threaten the very existence of the local assembly there. So immediately after Paul's greeting and building them up, he gets right into the admonition part of his letter. Uh, we can say he lays the axe at the root of the tree here um, and he addresses the most serious problem right off the bat. Let your minds go back now for a few minutes to our study a week ago and remember how division uh, or al and alienation by that division had taken place between believers in the assembly. The saints in Corinth had become a divided group. Uh, factions and cliques had developed over what some might think of as the silliest of reasons personality and presence or we might even say presentation uh, some were saying that they were of Paul some were saying they were of Apollos a great speaker or orator and there were others who wanted to be associated more with Peter because he was one of the kingpins he was the chief spokesman of the 12 apostles and still others said no we're identifying with Christ uh, divisions over personality over presentation or presence the human nature of pride doesn't require a whole lot of fuel <laughs> to ignite the flame of division. I think uh, most of us would agree with that. Uh, the spark at Corinth had to do with personality and presentation or presence. Uh, but down through the course of history, uh, there have been many sparks within the circles of those who profess to be believers and some have been sillier than others. Uh, and these are all recorded in history as debates among theologians that cause division. Uh, so as I said, some have been sillier than others. They're all silly, but they're serious because each one offers the potential for division and factions. If you think divisions over personality, status, or presence, or poor reasons to be separated, let me tell you about a few other things that have divided believers down through the 2,000 plus years of church history. Ancient records show that theologians have argued and divided over such trivial uh, things as these. How many angels can stand on the head of a pen? <laughs> Unreal, isn't it? Imagine how many angels could stand on the head of a pen and people become angry over the answers that some suggest. Others have ar argued over what shape Gabriel's wings might have been. These are all in history, folks. One record was kept of theologians arguing about whether or not Pilate used soap when he washed his hands. And another theological argument in church history was over the question, do any angels have baritone voices? You think these are ridiculous? Wait, hold on. <laughs> There's even a record of an argument over whether or not Christ could have changed himself into a pumpkin. That's actually one of the debates that ancient theologians argued over. Silly, but serious. Why again? Because the result is division, separation, factions. I'm siding with this fella. I'm siding with the other one. Uh, and there are many today. One is, uh, did Christ know the mystery while he's on? This is a present day argument. Did Christ know the mystery while he was on the earth and, and fleshed and taking on all the attributes of a man without sin while he was on the earth? Did he know the mystery at that time or did he not know the mystery? So, you know, why separate over, over things like that? Now, things that are not, you know, you just don't separate. Now, I will separate over the issue of reconciliation because that's the only thing in my book, that's the only hill worth separating on if somebody does not believe their sins were put away at Calvary, 
they've slapped God in the face and Jesus Christ who put those sins away at Calvary um, because he did that according to Paul. I, I read all these to show you that it doesn't take much to create division even among professing Christians. Uh, I might be as bold to say especially among those who proclaim to be professing Christians. Of course, most divisions are over much more serious topics than those I've mentioned, but the portion of scripture we'll be looking at today contains perhaps one of the greatest sources of division throughout the entire history of the professing, quote unquote, church, even down to the present hour. It's that subject of water baptism. And notice I said professing church. <laughs> uh, I know we've talked about this previously and, and at some length really, but since it's part of our text, as we come through, work our way through 1 Corinthians, we have to revisit it because I don't want to leave, I don't want to shortchange any section of this letter of Paul's. We want to cover everything as we go through it. Entire denominations have arisen over such questions as what's the proper way to baptize someone? Should we sprinkle them or should we pour some water on them or should the person be completely submerged, submersed underwater? And if we do that, should we do it forward or should we do it backwards? There's a lot of debate and separation over this. And is once enough or should we do it three times? Uh, these are all points of debate and contentions that have caused denominations to separate themselves uh, from others based solely on the particular mode of baptizing. And one would say to the other, if you don't do it this way, it doesn't count. You must do it our way. Uh, so they'd want you to be rebaptized if you're going to join their church by the people of their assembly. One pastor was proud to point out the fact that his church was so anxious to baptize new converts that even though he, one of the converts was in a wheelchair and unable to walk, they picked up the man and submerged him under the water, chair and all. And he was proud of that. So he was baptized right along with his wheelchair. Uh, well, another thing they argue about is who should be baptized. Uh, should it be adults or should it include young people? And how about infants? How about babies? Should they be baptized? Uh, others argue about how many times it needs to be done. Um, only once at the beginning of a person's Christian experience or as some preachers teach it should be done each time a person moves to a different church or rededicates his or her life to the Lord and how about the setting I mean how many things could they argue over how about the setting is an artificial water source less beneficial than a natural setting such as a lake or a pond um, and as you know the arguments don't end there some argue about what baptism accomplishes uh, what's the purpose? Does it symbolize something that's already taken place? Does it cause salvation to take place? Or does it identify the person with a particular church persuasion? Or does it add some kind of second blessing, some would say? Uh, what's the purpose of it? There are other arguments also, but I think you can see the point with just what I've brought up so far. These are all different questions that denominations have formed and that have formed different denominations all over the issue concerning a water ritual contained in Israel's law program. As we look at our text today, I'd like to break it down into three parts. First of all, we'll look at Paul's questions. There are three of them in verse 13. Then we'll look at Paul's so-called confusion because many commentators say Paul was confused when we come to verses 14 through 16. Actually, it was not confusion at all. It was a new commission, and we'll be talking about that as well. We'll look at Paul's commission in verse 17. Let's begin with the, with the three questions that Paul asks in, uh, in chapter 1, verse 13, where Paul begins, Is Christ divided? Chapter 1, verse 13. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you, or were you baptized in the name of Paul? The first question was this, Is Christ divided? And that should be a pretty easy answer, shouldn't it? The answer is obviously no. Christ was never divided. Christ is not divided. Christ is one and God is one. Uh, scripture tells us that. Christ is the visible manifestation of the invisible God. And the inference is that if Christ is not divided into different segments or sections that result in Godhead factions, <laughs> then neither should Christians be divided into different or several different factions or groups. If Christ is one, in the tripart Godhead is functioning with one mind and one judgment. All three members of the Godhead working together in concert, we could say. Then those who are believers in the gospel of Christ should realize that they are also one. And that we should also be working in concert. We are the body of Christ just as Christ is one. The whole issue in the context here is division within the body of Christ. That's where Paul's going. Then the second question, was Paul crucified for you? With this question, Paul's taking their eyes away from him. 
He wants their eyes off of him. He's eliminating the issues of personality and presence or presentation in the context of division. Of course, Paul wasn't crucified for them. Uh, they could answer that one very easily. Christ had been crucified them. So personality or presentation plays no part, should never play a part in the development of factions that lead to divisions. Uh, Paul takes their eyes off of him and he turns them instead to the one who had indeed been crucified for them, Jesus Christ. Personality should never be a reason for division. Christ's meek and mild demeanor, if you think about it, was one of the major reasons the Jews rejected him. They wanted a powerful warrior type savior who's going to come and, and conquer the, Roman, the Romans for their oppression over them. Uh, and then Christ came, meek and mild, and uh, they didn't like his look. Uh, he, there's no comeliness in him to be desired. He wasn't the, the Revlon pastor that came, preacher that came and spoke to them and filled the arenas. Uh, they didn't like his demeanor. If our focus is on personality instead of on the purpose and message of the person, uh, we can end up with divisions quite quickly. Uh, sometimes it's hard to separate the two, but there is a difference. The person is who somebody is. The personality is what somebody's like. Now, think about that for a few minutes. Christ's personality, his traits, his attributes, his mannerisms, his actions, do not make Christ who he is. That one you have to think about for a moment. These things are reflection or result of who Christ is and has always been. His personality, his attributes, his mannerisms were all a reflection of who he already is and has always been as the God-man. Uh, so those traits didn't make him the son of God. The fact that he is the son of God resulted in his actions and his traits. Are you with me so far? Okay. Christ is to be honored because he is the son of God. A visible manifestation of the invisible God. He isn't the son of God because of his particular manner and style. His particular man, manner and style were merely a reflection of who, is, of who he is as the God man. The same thing held true for the apostle Paul. Uh, Paul had the God-given authority of an apostle, didn't he? God is the one who chose Paul to be the apostle of the Gentiles. Not one of the apostles of the Gentiles, the sole apostle of the Gentiles. He was appointed to God to that office. But his presence was weak and his speech contemptible, the Bible tells us. Which doesn't mean he just had a stuttering way of talking. His speech was mean-spirited, the people who heard him said. Uh, they... They said he's very mean-spirited in the way he talks. Nevertheless, Paul was to be recognized for the authority he held as a God-ordained apostle, not for his demeanor or pleasing presentations. Uh, Paul said, was I crucified for you? Again, the answer is, of course not. Don't separate on the basis of personality or presence or personal achievement. Some people like to gravitate around those who have status. And I think that could have possibly played a big part into why these people were gravitating into the people, to the people they were separating themselves over. Now, isn't this third question interesting? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? Paul's talking about division in light of personality and presence, and all of a sudden he brings baptism into the equation. Why on earth would he do that? Uh, I think it's highly significant for two different reasons. Number one, the opposite of division is what? Anybody think of a word? Unity. unity. Exactly right. The opposite of division is unity. Hit it up the nail on the head. Uh, the operate, opposite of several is one. What is it that creates the oneness that we believers share alike? Our oneness in Christ, right? The answer is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 12 through 14. Verse 12 first, for as the body is one and hath many members, all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. Uh, verses 13 and 14, for one, by one spirit we are all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit, for the body is not one member but many. What creates our oneness again? The answer is baptism. <laughs> Baptism, Of course, which baptism is the crucial part of the issue here? Remember, the first question, is Christ divided? The answer is sitting in verse 12. We being many are one body, so also is Christ one body. Paul throws baptism right into the equation of division because first and foremost, it is the one baptism that Christ revealed to Paul that makes us one with our Savior and with other believers. Uh, 
we would not be one body in Christ apart from this one baptism. Now, Paul has to bring up the issue of baptism because baptism was obviously causing some of the division in Corinth. But I believe there's a second reason why Paul brings it up. Just as baptism is the source of our oneness as believers, it is also one of the major sources after personality of division among those who profess to be Christians today. Now, I believe that if all professing Christians could lay aside their personal preferences, what seems right in the area of baptism and come to an understanding of the one baptism as relayed to the Apostle Paul by the ascended Christ himself to, to relay to us, denominational barriers would lose just a little bit of the glue that helps keep them standing. Uh, not all of it, of course. <laughs> baptism isn't the only issue that separates people, but at least some of it. Unfortunately, the very thing that unites those who profess to be believers has been an issue of contention that has separated those who profess to be believers down through the ages. Uh, everybody with their own mode, method, and reasons for baptism. But the Corinthians had much more reason than we do today to let baptism be an issue of separation, at least until they received Paul's epistle. Remember where the assembly of Corinth had its beginning? Look back with me uh, to the book of Acts, chapter 18, verses 7 and 8, for just a moment here. And he, Paul, departed thence. Where did he depart from? He departed from the Jewish synagogue right next door. <laughs> and he, Paul, entered into a certain man's house named Justice, one that worshipped God. That's an important statement. Whose house joined hard to the synagogue. And Crispus, the chief ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his house. And many of the Corinthians hearing believed and were baptized. First question we must ask is this. Who was Justice? Let's go down the line. Who was Justice? Justice was a Gentile who had been brought under the influence of that Jewish synagogue in Corinth. And if you want validation for that or verification, you can consult Hastings Dictionary of the New Testament uh, to, to find out about that. In other words, Justice had been a convert to Judaism, which had been the case with other Gentiles in Corinth uh, who had not heard the gospel of God, but had been worshiping the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They were coming to God when the only way to come to God at that time was through the nation Israel. Uh, now think back. Look with me at the promise God had made to the Jewish nation in Exodus chapter 19, verses 5 and 6. Now therefore, if ye, Israelites, including Gentile proselytes to Judaism, if ye will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then ye, she shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. Ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel and all the Gentiles. I added something, didn't I? These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. In order for the Jewish nation to be given that position of prominence in relation to the Gentile nations, what were the Jews and the Gentile proselytes to Judaism required to do? They were required to make their law failure confession. That's what the law, the, that's what the Jews had to do. Uh, these, those Jews in Corinth, again along with those Gentile proselytes to Judaism, were now hearing from the Apostle Paul that Christ was indeed the Messiah that God had promised the Jewish nation. Upon learning that truth and believing that truth, you can see how they were now ready to make their law failure confession as called for in Leviticus chapter 26, verses 40 through 42. John's baptism with water had been the avenue for Israel's confession. That's why John came. Naturally, the people of the Jewish nation, Gentile proselytes to Judaism once again, upon learning the identity of Jesus Christ, were more than ready to make the confession that nation had been called upon to make in order for the Jews to be placed in that prominent position relative to the Gentile nations. Now look with me at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 14 through 16, which some have called Paul's confusion, uh, which really wasn't confusion at all. I thank God that I baptized none of you, Paul said, but Crispus and Gaius, um, lest any, and, and that word Gaius is pronounced differently, if you pronounce it correctly, yeah, but that's okay. Um, lest any should say that I had baptized in my own name, and I baptized also the household of Stephanus, besides I know not whether I baptized any other. Now commentators say, well, Paul was confused. He just didn't realize who all he'd baptized. I don't think Paul was saying, I thank God I baptized none of you but Crispus and Gaius because he knew these Corinthian proselytes to Judaism were not supposed to be baptized. Yes, they were. 
if they wanted to make their law failure confession so God would restore that nation to its place of prominence. That isn't the reason why Paul wasn't, was uh, grateful he hadn't baptized more. Why then was Paul thankful that he hadn't baptized more people than he had baptized? Um, the first reading is sitting in verse 15. Lest any should say that I had baptized in mine own name. That was Paul's first reason. We can understand this reason when we look back at the nation's promise uh, to God as it appears in three separate verses. Exodus chapter 19, verse 8, chapter 24, verse 3, and Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 25. When given the law, God told Moses, take these words to the people and bring back their words to me. That is when Israel had their first opportunity to say, you've already proven that we don't have any righteousness in us. You proved that in the wilderness. Uh, in your Bible, you see, there he proved them whether he, they would obey him or not. Did he prove they would obey or be disobedient? In every case, he proved they would diso be disobedient. Now, in light of all they had, should have learned about their inability to measure up to his commands and direction because they had a sin nature, when given the law, look at the promise made by the people of Israel. Exodus 19.8, And all the people answered together and said, All that the Lord has spoken, we will do. Not we'll do our best, we'll try as hard as we can. Forgive us when we fail. Uh -uh. All that the Lord has spoken, we will do. And Moses returned the words of the people unto the Lord. That's pretty straightforward, isn't it? You give us a law, you give us this law, we're going to do it. We're going to do all of it. We're going to do it consistently. Not only faithfully, but consistently. Exodus 24, 3. Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord and all the judgments. And all the people answered with one voice and said, All the words that the Lord has said, we will do. Wow. <laughs> Deuteronomy 6, 25. And it shall be our righteousness. You can, you can consider us righteous, God, if... We observe to do how many? All these commandments before the Lord our God as he hath commanded us. They lied when they made that oath to God. And Hosea says they lied. To whom had the people of the nation Israel made their law-keeping promise? They certainly hadn't made it to the Apostle Paul. <laughs> Who had they made it to? Were the Jews then to make their law failure confession to Paul? Did they owe Paul a confession of the nation's failure when it came to the law that God had given them? Not Paul. The answer to that is obvious to everyone sitting here. The people of the nation of Israel had promised God they could fulfill the law. Not only in its entirety, but also consistently. Their baptism was centered around that confession. That's what that confession was about. So their law failure confession certainly wouldn't be made in the name of Paul. Nor would it be made to Paul. But Paul continued on in verses 14 and 16. I thank God that I baptized none of you but Crispus and Gaios. That's how you pronounce that, isn't it? The Greek spelling and the Greek pronunciation is kind of interesting. Uh, I baptized Crispus and Gaios, and I baptized also the household of Stephanus. Besides, I know not whether I baptized any other. Obviously, it wasn't a very important issue to Paul, was it? Why did Paul mention, and by name, those that he did baptize, such as Crispus and and Gaius, as we might say today. Let's take a closer look. Crispus was the chief ruler of the Jewish synagogue in Corinth, according to what we just read a little bit ago. Being Jewish and a chief ruler of the Jewish synagogue, no less, can you see why Paul would have been willing to honor the request, a request of Crispus to make his law failure confession? Crispus was Jewish. What about Gaius, or Gaius, however you want to pronounce it? What about him? Who was he? There are several men named that, given that name in Scripture. Of this particular uh, Gaius, we're not told anything, but being mentioned in the same breath as Crispus, the chief ruler of the Jewish synagogue in Corinth, not difficult to imagine that Gaius might have played a prominent role in that synagogue as well. Um, then Paul mentioned that he baptized the household of Stephanus. So who was this Stephanus? And why did Paul baptize him? Well, in 1 Corinthians chapter 16... Verse 15, we get a much clearer picture of Stephanus. And I'll take you there in just a moment. But notice that the ones Paul baptized were either Jewish or they were worshiping the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob as Gentile proselytes to Judaism. All right there associated with the synagogue located in Corinth. Notice with me, 1 Corinthians 16, 15, you'll get a little more idea of who the Stephanus was. I beseech you, brethren... Ye know the house of Stephanus, that it is the first fruits of what? 
Achaia and that they have addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints. The first fruits of Achaia. Now where did Paul always go first when he visited a new territory? You know the answer. He always first visit, visit the, visited the Jewish synagogue in the area where he, where he would find unbelieving Jews in order to convince those unbelieving Jews that Jesus Christ was indeed their promised Messiah. He always went to the synagogue. Everywhere he went, he went there first. Check out Paul's journeys. And you'll find that the Jewish synagogue of unbelievers always came first when it came to Paul's travels. Uh, if the household of Stephanus was the first fruits of Achaia, Achaia being the province where Corinth was located, then the household of Stephanus would have been directly linked to the Jewish synagogue in Corinth because that's where Paul went first. And if Stephanus was the first fruits that Paul reached and Paul first went to the Jewish synagogue, what can we assume about Stephanus? Whether he was Jewish or whether he was a Gentile proselyte to Judaism, he was associated with that Jewish synagogue in Corinth. Are you connecting the dots here? Hopefully you are. Uh, upon learning that Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth was Messiah, the Messiah that God had promised the Jewish people and knowing the prominent position God had promised to those of the nation willing to make their law failure confession along with proselytes, uh, what would Stephanus, associated with that synagogue in Corinth, have been ready to do at that time and wanting to do? He would have been ready to make his law failure confession, that's what, because he was associated with the Jewish program. And then there's a second reason Paul gives for being thankful that he only baptized a few. Those few being either Jews or proselytes to Judaism once again. Now we come to Paul's commission. And a second reason he was thankful he had baptized only a few. Look at verse 17. For Christ sent me, next word, not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. First of all, Paul was glad he hadn't baptized many of them because he didn't want them to form a sect around him. Uh, but secondly, Paul was glad that he hadn't baptized more than a few because Paul's commission was not to prompt the nation Israel to make their law failure confession. That wasn't his purpose. Paul had been given an entirely different commission. We can show that something new was taking place when we consider Paul's statement in light of other statements found in Scripture. For instance, let me ask the question. Could John the Baptist have said that he was sent not to baptize? <laughs> That's an obvious one, isn't it? Now just the opposite was true. Could the 12 apostles have said that they were sent not to baptize? Again, the answer is no. They couldn't have said that. Let's prove it. Look back with me to John's Gospel, chapter 1. We'll also look back at Matthew, chapter 28. Keep Paul's statement in mind that he was not sent to baptize. Christ sent me not to baptize, Paul said, but to preach the gospel. Now notice what we find here in John's Gospel pertaining to John himself. And I, John, knew him, Jesus Christ, not, meaning I didn't know Christ in any other way, but that he should be made manifest to whom? Therefore, meaning that's why am I come baptizing with water. You see it? Now keep this verse in mind for future reference. John's baptism pertained to the manifestation of Christ to whom again? Israel. Verse 32 continues. And John bare record, saying, I saw the Spirit descending up from heaven like a dove and it abode upon him, on Christ that is. Now watch John reiterate what he had been sent to do in the first part of verse 33. And I knew him, Jesus Christ not, I didn't know him in any other way, but he that sent me to do what? Baptize with water. Was John sent to baptize with water? <laughs> he said so right there. He was specifically sent to baptize. But that's not what Paul was sent to do, was he? Now, let's quickly go to Matthew chapter 28 and show that the 12 apostles, what they were sent to do. This would have been a part of their commission. They didn't have any choice in the matter, by the way. They had to do it if they were going to obey what Christ had told them to do. Here it is in Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 and 19. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, doing what? baptizing them. Was there any question about what the twelve were sent to do? No. The twelve had been told to do it by none other than Lord Jesus Christ himself. It was part of their commission. Keep in mind that the law program was still in effect and the only way Gentiles could come to God was through the nation that God had promised to make of Abram. Christ here was still speaking on earth while he was instructing his twelve apostles. When Israel's promised earthly kingdom comes to fruition, the Gentiles are to come to God through Israel, aren't they? They're going to take hold of the skirt of him that is a Jew. 
the Bible tells us, saying, we will go with you for we have heard that God is with you Jews. And that'll be true. What was Christ telling the 12 to do at that, at that point, at that juncture in history? He was saying, go to it, guys. Get out to those Gentile nations because they're supposed to learn about me from you, from you folks. And so both John and the 12 apostles were specifically sent to baptize in connection with the Jewish nation and Gentile proselytes to Judaism. Many teach that Paul was simply doing the same thing that the 12 apostles were doing, uh, that he was working under the same commission as the 12, but that cannot be the case. Otherwise, Paul could not have said what he did say, could he? <laughs> uh, Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Paul had been given a brand new commission. And now what we need to point out is that there is a new baptism revealed by Paul. A baptism uh, apart from the law of Moses, totally apart from the law of Moses. In scripture we find a progressive revelation concerning baptism. I want to show you that today. As with many truths, baptism is not explained all at once in the Bible. Uh, it happened over a period of centuries. And let's show how baptism changed over a period of time. We'll briefly walk through six stages of the revelation concerning baptism as we find that revelation in the Word of God. I want to show you that what's happening in the dispensation of the grace of God as far as baptism is concerned is nothing like what had ever happened before. Um, it's an entirely new thing. So let's look at the what I now will say seven stages of the revelation concerning baptism. The first point is this. The Old Testament washings were baptisms. How do we know? We get that straight from Hebrews chapter 9 verse 10. Look, look first at verse 1. Then verily the first covenant, that's the law, had also ordinances of, div of divine service and wor a worldly sanctuary. The worldly sanctuary spoken of here was that tabernacle in the Old Testament. Now what were the ordinances of, ordinances of divine service? Some of them are mentioned in verse 10. Which stood only in meats and drinks there it's at. Which stood only in meats and drinks and different or various washings and cardinal ordinances imposed on them until the time of the Reformation. The diverse washings there literally are different baptisms. Washings is baptismos, the same word, baptisms. If you take your concordance and look up the word washings, as it's found in Hebrews 9.10, it's the word translated baptism elsewhere in the Bible. And so that tells us that all of the washings all of the ritual water ceremonies of the Old Testament tabernacle were baptisms. This comes as a surprise to many folks. Uh, some folks think that baptism began with John the Baptist, but that's not so. Uh, it has been there all along, and we need to understand what these baptisms were for. So let's go back to Exodus. We're going to, go, we're going to look at a couple verses there. First of all, chapter 29. I'm just pulling this out of the hat. Uh, there are many, many washings I could show you. We could go through them, but we'll pick one that's representative of the, all the Old Testament baptisms. Point number one was that the Old Testament washings were baptisms. We got that. Think of those washings as baptisms because that's what the book of Hebrews uh, we just read told us they were. In order to enter the priesthood, you had to be baptized. That's point number two. And this is the thing in Exodus 29, that thou shalt do unto them to hallow them to minister unto me in the priest's office. And it goes on to describe the sacrifice that was necessary to hallow these priests as they would enter, enter into their priesthood. Then in verse 4 it says, And Aaron and his sons thou shalt bring unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation and shalt do what? Wash them with water. So there we have the required entrance to the priesthood. And it was washing. Now if we take what we know from the book of Hebrews, where washings is the same thing as baptisms, we could read that verse this way, and shall baptize them with water, <laughs> because it meant washing. Now let's look back a few chapters to Exodus chapter 19, and I want to give you the third statement concerning God's revelation on baptism. The Old Testament washings were baptisms, entering the priesthood required water baptism. Now point number three, Israel's to become what? A kingdom of priests. Exodus chapter 19, verse 6. And ye, Israel, shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. Now, what's so great about that? Think about this for a minute. You have to understand, when this was spoken, God originally only allowed one tribe to become priests. The, tree, the tribe of Levi, right? 
But the promise that God's making here is that not only one tribe will be priests, but the whole nation of Israel will become priests of God in a day yet future. Uh, let's read it once again. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. Now look with me at Luke's gospel. Uh, hopefully you're following the progression here. The Old Testament washings were baptisms. In order to be a priest, you had to be baptized. Israel's promise that she would become a kingdom of priests. Can you see the next point coming? What was the next logical step? If Israel's to be promised to become an entire kingdom of priests, and if you had to be baptized in order to become a priest, what does God need to tell Israel that they are to do if they want to be priests? They need to be baptized. That was one of the requirements of becoming a priest in connection with the nation Israel. And that's exactly what John the Baptist came to do. To prepare Israel for that priestly function they'll be performing during the millennial reign of Jesus Christ on the earth. And they will have to confess their failure under the contract just as the priest had to make sacrifice for himself first before he could make sacrifice for the people. Point number four, the Israelites needed to be baptized. <laughs> Simple as that. Notice with me Luke chapter 3, verses 3 through 6. And he, John the Baptist, came into all the country about Jordan, preaching the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. And as we written in the book of the words of Isaiah, of the prophet, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Verse 5, Every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill shall be brought low, and the crooked shall be made straight. And the rough ways shall be made smooth. By the way, when, when is what's described in that verse going to take place? This is about the millennial reign of Jesus Christ on the earth, folks. And this is what John came to prepare the nation for, the nation that's going to become a kingdom of priests when this takes place. Notice verse 6. And all flesh shall see the salvation of God. That salvation of God is going to be for Israel, and everybody's going to see what God's doing through Israel when this millennial kingdom is set up. Follow the progression once again. Old Testament saints, the Old Testament washings were baptisms. Entering the priesthood required baptism. Israel's would become a kingdom of priests. Therefore, Israel needed to be baptized. And the fifth thing we want to show is that the 12 apostles continued the same ministry as John. They weren't doing anything different. Now look back at Luke chapter 3, verse 3. And he, John, the baptizer, came into all the country about Jordan, preaching the baptism of a change of thinking for the nation, for the remission of their sins. Think about those words for a moment. John preached the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. What I want to show you is that Peter preached the very same thing. Notice Acts chapter 2, verse 38. The reason I want to point this out is because many today teach that John's baptism was for Israel. They acknowledge that John ministered to Israel. But then they say that the 12 apostles were doing something different. Uh, they say that the 12 apostles ministered to the body of Christ. Well, look at Acts chapter 2, verse 38. What did John preach again? He preached the baptism of a change of thinking for the remission of Israel's sins. What did Peter preach prior to learning about the new dispensation from the Apostle Paul? Did he preach something different? Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized. How many? Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ. What for? For the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Peter preached the exact same thing regarding baptism as John the Baptist preached. In Acts chapter 2, the new dispensation had not begun. So prior to learning about the revelation of the mystery from the Apostle Paul, Peter preached the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. The twelve apostles continued preaching the very same thing that John had preached. Did they offer the kingdom just like John had been preparing Israel for that kingdom? Look at chapter 3 of Acts. Change your thinking, Israel, therefore, plural, nationally, and be converted that your sins may be blotted out nationally when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord because the Lord is going to sprinkle them with clean water when he calls them into the, to the, to the land that he promised them. The times of refreshing, folks, is directly connected to the millennial reign of Jesus Christ on the earth. Moving ahead to verses 20 and 21. And he, God the Father, shall send Jesus Christ, which was before preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things, which God hath spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. Wow. At this point, I want to further emphasize something about the twelve apostles. Let's go to 1 Peter chapter 2. What I want to show you here is that even in later years, the apostle, the apostle Peter continued to preach about the nation Israel's promised special position. In 1 Peter chapter 2, 
Peter was writing to the sojourners scattered abroad. Broad. This would have been the Jews. These are Jews of the dispersion, the diaspora, and even the Gentile proselytes to Judaism who had been dispersed. Do you remember what we read back in Exodus? What did God promise Israel? Ye shall be unto me a what again? A kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which thou shall speak in the children of Israel. Look with me now at 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood and holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. These were the believers Peter was speaking to. Who were those words for once again? Exodus 19 said that these are the words you shall speak to the children of Israel. So you see, many today make the mistake of saying that the body of Christ is a royal priesthood and we're a holy nation, a kingdom of priests. But that's simply not the case, folks. Peter's writing to the Israelites. Nowhere in all of Paul's 13 letters does the Apostle Paul call believers a royal priesthood and a holy nation the kingdom of priests. Uh, yet, uh, all believers are definitely set apart as holy, we know that, uh, along with the entire household of faith in our union with our perfectly holy Savior. However, we are not a peculiar treasure unto God, a nation above all the other nations of the earth, a holy nation in the kingdom of priests. Uh, then the sixth point you want to bring out is this. When Israel as a nation rejected their king and his prophesied kingdom, the need for water baptism ceased. The law program had been put on hold as God ceased dealing with Israel on a national level. When did that rejection come? It came when the time associated with the parable of the fig tree uh, and what's often referred to as Israel's one-year extension to make their law failure confession had finally run its course and that came at the stoning of Stephen. With the change of dispensation at the stoning of Stephen, God, God ceased dealing with Israel on a national level and he began dealing with all men alike, Jews and Gentiles, according to the house rules, the dispensation or oikonomia, economy, of the grace of God. Uh, will God one day begin dealing with Israel on a national level once again? The answer is yes, he will. Uh, if we believe the prophecies concerning national Israel and Christ's prophesied millennial reign as relayed by our prophets, the answer is yes, that day will indeed come. And we'll be talking about that lessons that lie ahead. But for now, our final point in today's study, point number seven, as we bring it to a close here, we've already mentioned the revelation of the one baptism to the Apostle Paul supersedes all previous baptisms. At the beginning of the Acts period, water baptism was extremely important. Repent and be baptized for remission of your sins. I'd say that's pretty important. Uh, and that was a directive given specifically to the law contract nation. Now, we return to the epistle of our present study the book of 1 Corinthians written by Paul, God's appointed apostle uh, to the Gentiles and the new dispensation committed to his trust. Is the, this, is the one baptism revealed to Paul to make all men see found in Paul's very first letter to the saints in Corinth? The answer is yes, here it is. Second, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13. For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. You see, Paul hadn't been sent to baptize because Paul had been given further revelation concerning baptism. This was not a message taught by all the holy prophets since the world began. This was a message that God had been keeping secret since before the world had begun. That's quite different. And the apostle Paul revealed it to the carnal saints in Corinth. This was not only a new and different baptism, it's the only baptism that remains according to Ephesians chapter 4, verses 4 and 5. There is one body, one spirit, even as you're called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith. How many baptisms? How many do we want to hang on today? Some say, well, not three maybe, but at least two. <laughs> Others say three. Some say two. We say one. Okay, the Holy Spirit is the baptizer. He baptizes us, immerses us places us not into H2O, but into a person, the person of Christ, making us a brand new creation. We have a brand new identity. For by one spirit, we are all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews and Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. So matter not, no matter what a person's view on baptism, or whether or not they agree with us, we believe what's recorded in Romans chapter 12, verse 5. So we, being many, are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another. Some may consider us not to be one with them, but if 
Very large if. If they've trusted solely in what Christ accomplished where their sins are concerned, when he died in mankind's stead for those sins on the cross of Calvary, we do consider them one with us and love them sincerely as fellow members of the body of Christ. But reconciliation is the key that has to be understood. What Christ accomplished when he died for our sins at Calvary is what makes Paul's gospel good news. <laughs> if he didn't accomplish what he came to do, Paul's gospel wouldn't be called the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. It would just be, well, the good news of something God will be able to do later on in your life if you allow him to. Um, justification unto eternal life is not about baptism. We know that. It's not about gaining the forgiveness of sins that are no longer being imputed to the accounts of sinners. That's all of us. In that all sins were imputed to the person of our Savior at Calvary. Justification unto eternal life is about believing what the Apostle Paul calls the ministry of reconciliation. Christ reconciled the entire human race to God where our sins are concerned. Belief in that truth is what accomplishes our union with Christ and therefore our justification unto eternal life. This is why the Apostle proclaimed the Jews and Gentile alike that there's only one baptism remaining in Ephesians 4 and 5. One Lord, one faith. To adopt any other view is to create division. All right, let's stop there. We'll be dismissed and then we'll come back in, uh, what, maybe a quarter till or so. You've got a few minutes to run to the restroom and maybe grab some refreshment. Didn't leave you much time. We started a little late. All right, let's, uh, let's look to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for what you show us in your word as we dig into your word and mine out the golden truths that are found there. And we'll never exhaust your book. We, we could study our lifetimes and there's still more there for us to find if, if we were around to find them. We just thank you that uh, you are God, that we are sinful man. Uh, but in addition to being sinful man, we've been forgiven at Calvary. And you simply are asking us to take you at your word and believe that we have been forgiven at Calvary. And when we do that, uh, you credit us with a righteousness belonging to the God-man himself. Your own righteousness. It's a gift of righteousness, a gift decree. We thank you so much for that. And I thank you for the folks that are here this morning to hear your word. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.